the founder articulated a vision which basically said that Uber would not be profitable until it got rid of the human beings out of the equation. Sponsoring the mandated free trial and offering this tri a free trial will not only attract buyers who were already considering it, um, but it might also turn some people away. So the, the, the revenue grew from around 100 million in the year 2019 to about 400 million in, in uh, 2023. So it was a 4X and they anticipate uh, revenue to hit about uh, 630 million in 2026. <laughs> Hi there, and welcome to Stock Club, a podcast brought to you by My Wall Street. I'm Mike, and joining me in today's episode is My Wall Street's chief investor, Emmett Savage. Every month here at My Wall Street, we publish our Stock of the Month in our Invest Plus service. Stock of the Month has an unbeaten track history of success. It's up about 5x uh, since its inception compared to the S&P 500, which is up about 2x. So it's doing pretty well. Uh, not only that, but with Invest Plus, you also get our 10 foundational stocks, a library of 60 stocks, your weekly charging and fearless newsletter, and if you have any room left, we're also including a bonus wildcard report as well. For our loyal Stock Club listeners, you can get $50 off this bundle with the promo code STOCKCLUB50. That is STOCKCLUB50, all caps. That will give you all that and more for a nice little discount. So check it out. Uh, there's also a link in our show notes. Today's podcast is brought to you by Vodafone Business. Now, if you like us here in my Wall Street, you'll know that running a business is difficult. There are countless things to think about, and many often simply get ignored or completely forgotten about. That's where Vodafone Business can help. They've crafted a suite of tools and support to boost your business's operation, and the best part is it's free for everyone. From cybersecurity to harnessing the power of AI, building a website, improving how your teams work remotely, Vodafone Business will help you address the often overlooked but crucial elements for your business's success. To get started today, check out their one-to-one VHub digital support and advice service. You'll find everything you need right there. Uh, or you can also find the link in our show notes. Or just simply Google Vodafone VHub for more information. Now, let's get into today's episode. Emmett, how are we doing? Hey Mike, how's it going? All good, all good. I hope you're uh, recharged after yesterday's Total Eclipse. Yeah, actually, do you know, I remember a Total Eclipse in around, I think it was around the year 2000, maybe 2001. Uh, I remember because we all left our office and we went out to look up at the sun and burn our eyes out. And yeah, there was a there was a, a, an impressive solar eclipse in Ireland 23 years ago. I don't care what anyone says. I was there. This is not the first one in 150 years. I saw the original. Um, but yeah, it was um, uh, yesterday's was more impressive by watching it on TV because over here in Ireland, I don't think we got a lot of it. No, I saw one photo. Um because obviously it was so overcast and very Irish and gray yesterday, but there was one photo from the Aran Islands where you could kind of see through the clouds, small like sliver of sun behind a black dot, but it was classed, wasn't it? Jeez, I, cu I couldn't get over it, like how distinct and immediate it was once it comes across. I am actually starting to doubt we're on a flat earth. I mean, I've been a devotee to that theory. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's evidence. There's evidence we're not. We could start a whole different podcast, Emmett, if that's your views. <laughs> okay, on conspiracy theories, let's kick off. All right. Um, well, well, geez, I hope this isn't a conspiracy theory because also then it gets a lot more distinct. Uh, we're talking about autonomous driving. So it's a topic that pops up every now and then is one of these great futuristic trends that it's, it's always mentioned, but we haven't really seen it come to fruition yet, which is to be expected as well for something this futuristic but it's always been kind of just around the corner you know what i mean it's like oh well we'll have autonomous driving then and then this will make sense and stuff so popped up a bit in the news over the past few weeks so i thought it was worth talking about um obviously tesla it's probably the most guilty for being the one saying it's just around the corner every few months uh, i think elon musk promised it first back in 2018 or something um, but I wanted to start with a different story, which is Waymo and Uber Eats. So Uber and Waymo have had a relationship going back a good few years. There were the first robo taxis through Uber available, I think, in October. Um, and last week saw the partnership extend to Uber Eats, obviously Uber's food delivery arm. So users in Phoenix... Phoenix area and a couple areas around Phoenix, uh, Tempe, Chandler, and Mesa, I think, which I think are just kind of suburbs, essentially, um, were able to order food from Uber Eats, and it would come in one of Waymo's driverless cars. 
Uh, so, it, it, like, aside from everything else, it's just pretty cool. Like, you know what I mean? If you're getting a hungover burger and chips and a flipping robot shows up at your door, do you know? I mean, I have a question. When the car pulls up at your driver outside your apartment, do you run down and open the passenger door and take it off the passenger seat? Or is it in the boot, as we say over here, or the trunk? Or like, what? Wh where is it? Where is the food? I don't know. I, I, I would assume it'd be in the boot, yeah. And then the boot just kind of pops up when you get there or something. But, but um, yeah, it definitely feels like for a company like Uber or a lot of the gig economy in general, this feels a bit like an end goal. Do you know what I mean? It's like this this business model makes a lot more sense if there's no staff workers, which we'll get into the problems with that. But if you think about it, if it's just a fleet of robo taxis and no staff costs and none of the headaches that come with those staff costs, and you look at California now with the gig economy, um, the gig economy act that just came in, and having to well look it's not a bad thing that these companies have to treat those workers like real workers, but it doesn't play into their kind of models, which maybe if Uber had this long term vision that didn't involve workers and it was based on the kind of robo taxis, maybe that probably explains why they're so not bothered about workers, which is an awful statement to say probably has a bit of, bit of legs. I think it's the reality. I, I, it more than has legs, Mike. I remember a couple of years ago, the guy who succeeded Travis Callan, I, he's probably the current CEO. I can't even remember. Ko, Kora Shani. I can't pronounce the second name, but Dara. <laughs> Dara. Dara, not the Irish spelling. Yeah, no, but there was a guy, well, the guy who uh, succeeded the founder articulated a vision which basically said that Uber would not be profitable until it got rid of the human beings out of the equation. Um, and I remember at the time it was quite controversial. We possibly spoke about it here in Stock Club. But I think what you've said is on the money. Like we're, we are looking at a, a new way of life, if you like, and we're looking at the thin end of the wedge because uh, way more, way more powered cab, still in an inelegant looking machine. A friend of mine, Philip, was in California recently and he sent me a video of uh, a self drive car beside him, which we haven't really seen on the streets in Ireland yet. So it was a novelty to us. And it had a whole contraption on the roof, which I'm sure our American listeners are more than well aware of. But for me, it was a revelation. I didn't realize that they had a camera crew <laughs> sitting on the roof of the car. But it was, um, but this is really the thin end of the wedge. This is the introduction. As these things go, it will be a landslide moment where all of a sudden it's everywhere. And we haven't crossed the chasm yet. We haven't, we're still in the first 5% or, or, you know, the early 5% or whatever. 1%, yeah. And I, when you talk about that landslide, Slide. I think that's maybe too fast a description. I think it might be more like soil creep, if you remember your geography lessons. Well, it is. Well, this is the thing. Uh, everything is slow until it's figured, and these things generally get figured at pace. You know, it's compounded learning by Waymo and Uber, and at the end of every day, a whole set of new data that's being looped back into the system for further improvement. What I will say is that it's region specific, so it's it's not by coincidence that it's only happening in Phoenix right now because that's where a lot of Waymo, especially, has done so much training. So there's five five stages of autonomous driving, where one would be kind of cruise control in your car, and five is this car can go wherever it wants and be a perfect driver and yada yada. And I think. I can't remember. I think Tesla's autopilot was only around two and Waymo was three, but four in certain areas where it has the region mapped out perfectly. And that's probably why I'm not getting too excited about, well, Uber will put aside because Uber is kind of a customer, but Waymo will say, because it's only very specific areas that it's allowed operating and you're not going to be able to fall into a robo taxi on Harcourt Street anytime soon, even though the technology might be ready, the regulations, the training of the system won't be for a very long time. There's actually, there was uproar last December. So two, two, two Waymo cars in quick succession crashed into this. It was, uh, it was a pickup truck being towed by a tow truck, I think. 
and it actually happened within within minutes of each other. So obviously the system, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So it, so it was obviously an anomaly that the system hadn't processed yet and couldn't couldn't deal with essentially, um, and that stopped. Uh, I think LA and San Francisco, it might have been just San Francisco, basically suspended uh, Waymo's license until they fixed the issue, essentially. Um, and there's a lot of other pushbacks. Obviously, there's the pushbacks behind the taxi industry, the potential job losses, but advocates there as well. And the safety aspect is where it does get messy because you can cite human error and cite how, like, geez, Ireland is going through an awful year of deaths on the road. But when you talk about culpability, you can't just run a software system. Do you know what I mean? Like GM's cruise, uh, it hit a pedestrian last year and, and I think couldn't stop, it dragged it along for 20 meters or something. And, and they, they, they shut up shop. They, they, they basically called it off. Apple ditched the Apple car project too. I'd say they just did not like the aspect of we are fully responsible for anything that happens on the roads and roads we take for granted, but they are incredibly dangerous places. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, it's more dangerous. It's, I think it's the most dangerous everyday activity people do is get in the car, which is a bit grim. So, so yeah, looking at everything, it's very exciting to see developments like this. And it would be amazing to get your robo taxi to drop off your, drop off your take or get a lift into town and you don't have to tip anyone. You know what I mean? It's good for the customers as well, obviously, and it would be cheaper across the board, but the stakes are so much higher and it won't be, it won't be a smooth rollout, I guess, is what I'm saying. I think there will be pockets like Phoenix, parts of San Francisco, LA as well. I think Vegas are bringing them in too, but to just, I don't know. We always think of like a software being like, oh, if it works, global rollout that's how that's how it goes and it's it won't be the case with driving um so yeah that's waymo which and waymo from a quick glance seems to be the most advanced it seems to be ahead of tesla which we'll get into now um but yeah and also sorry we're talking about uber and uh it seems like a great idea uber becomes waymo's customer but surely this is probably a story for another time but surely waymo could set up a few apps and put Uber out of business pretty quick if they wanted to as well. Wouldn't you think so? I mean, when you think about the movement of self-driving cars, it's as you articulated there, it's really um, operating in an area, if we call it an area, uh, where it has the greatest amount of young fatalities. There seems to be a very dark league table of what's the greatest cause of young deaths in the world. And usually there's top three that are there but motor motoring and all things to do with automotive is usually near or at the top spot so when you introduce the technology you want to see that metric improve so when we look at case studies of somebody who died as a consequence of self-driving it is tragic um but you it might actually be on the big picture fewer deaths per million miles traveled. And I think all the automotive, all the car makers basically record deaths per million miles of road traveled, which again is a grim metric. And I think the only car at least several years ago that had zero deaths per million miles traveled was um, the Volvo uh, kind of crossover. It was like the C80 or something like that. I don't know what it was called, but it was a big Volvo. It was the only car that could boast that it had zero deaths per million mi miles traveled. When Tesla went out self-driving. They also published their deaths per million miles traveled, and it was a step below basically all, all the peer comparisons. Now, I don't know where it is now, and that's actually a very hot topic, I suppose, and a good segue in, into a discussion about Tesla. Yeah, exactly. So you're looking into the, there's a trial that just started this week, was it, over its autopilot? 
Well, you're right. I mean, there's two competing stories on, on Tesla as usual. And, and the first one is that Tesla is preparing for one of the biggest tests of its driver assisted autopilot uh, in its defense by saying that basically it was not responsible for a very sad road death. And, and then the other story, almost comically, is that they're about to start to give every customer in the US a one month free trial of its 12 grand a year driver assistance service, which it calls full self driving beta. Um, and they've pr- once they have the car and the compatible hardware. So right now out there in the ether, there's two stories, one, which is this landmark, uh, case. And then the other one, which is a free trial of the software, if you like, that is central to the case. Like Philip Meyer has given out free cigarettes. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. And and the it's funny you should say that because the free trial of the software was mandated at Elon Musk's request. And he's saying that prospective buyers must be given a demo of the software before they purchase a Tesla. You know, it's almost like a Monty Python sketch. Hello, I'm here to buy a Tesla. Well, not until we give you a free trial. It's like, no, 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 here's my wallet. I don't want it. To put it into context, uh, the full self-drive is an add-on when you buy a Tesla and it costs, what, like 10 grand a year or something like that, is it? 12 grand a year, it's expensive. But I mean, like, it's 12 grand a year, I don't know, um, really, what what is it displacing? It's it's saving you time. Like, it's you have a, a dedicated driver, you know, once upon a time, the preserve of the rich and, and the prosperous and, and the fortune was a driver. But now, all of a sudden, it's introducing that concept for the masses. And as you said, Harcourt Street, you can go into Harcourt Street and drink the head off yourself. And you can go whenever you whenever you want he's waiting for you or it's waiting for you anyway it actually it's funny because it, the whole story made me recall something that rory said on the podcast many moons ago and he said that a day will come where driving your own car is seen as as irresponsible as smoking is seen today so when you think about back to that point you made a moment ago about the number of deaths on the road and 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 the fact that it is such a dangerous place if and when, I should say when, there's no way if when autonomous driving has has been, all the, the bugs, if you like, have been resolved, and it is unquestionably safer than a human-driven uh, dri- vehicle where people are prone to being sleepy or intoxicated or under any other influence or distraction, um, it's going to be seen as an irresponsible thing. So when at right now, when you, in Ireland, you see generally a young man drive past with his foot to the floor. People of my age, like roll their eyeballs upwards into the heavens, go that young fella, he doesn't know what he's up to. It's so dangerous. But when eventually that risk has been removed from society, we'll all be, I think, a little bit happier. And, and I guess that's the analogy about it. It will be seen as irresponsible as smoking is today. Anyway, I digress to dive back into the story, which was uh, the court case. Well, this week, a court is going to decide if Tesla is to blame for a crash that killed a young man called Walter Hang, who was a 38-year-old Apple engineer in 2018. And he died in California when his Tesla X hit a highway barrier while using the Tesla autopilot system. And it was 2018, so quite a lot of technical waters passed under the bridge between then and now. Five years of development, one would have to hope it has improved. But anyway, Hang's family are suing Tesla and are arguing that Tesla made autopilot seem more capable than it actually is and didn't do enough to stop people from misusing it. And Tesla is blaming the deceased and saying that he was playing a video game instead of paying attention while the autopilot was on. And while it is agreed by all that Wang was distracted, his family believes that Tesla's advertising of autopilot is the real problem. And if his family wins, it could really cost Tesla an awful lot of money and lead to loss, a whole lot of lawsuits, as you, as you can imagine. Uh, and, and Tesla is already dealing with other legal issues about autopilot. The, the spotlight is on this one because the case is this week and had the most tragic outcomes. And experts are watching the case closely because it really could lead to a massive payout based on how much money Wang even would have earned if he hadn't died. I mean, there's all these ways of measuring what is the value, but that is one that is being muted around at the moment. And so Tesla hasn't comment, uh, commented on this lawsuit, and the trial is happening in San Jose in California, and it's starting by picking a jury on Monday, I believe, and the main arguments are probably going to begin more or less when this podcast goes live on Thursday, and the trial, they say, is going to take 
several weeks, but it's a really big deal. Um, I'm not sure if it's a landmark case. I think it's a landmark case. I'd need to actually get a, do a quick Google of what defines a landmark case. I think it's a landmark case um, because there's so much attention on autopilot from various government agencies, as you might expect, and they're checking if Tesla misled customers and investors about how well the software and the system works. And over 40 crashes involving autopilot are currently being investigated with 23 deaths. So Wang is the focal point of of what is uh, and has been a far bigger problem. And despite these concerns, autopilot and a more advanced version, the full self-driving, are still for sale, as we've discussed, and in fact, more than for sale. Um, so really, it's, it's, a very, uh, it's a very interesting uh, case study at the moment. And, and, you know, Tesla has updated autopilot, has warnings and telling drivers to pay attention after, I suppose, regulators looked at the system. And it has won the last two court cases. This is quite interesting on autopilot because the jury decided that Tesla was not at fault because they found no issue with how autopilot was made. And the thing I don't get, Mike, and I'd love your opinion on this, is you're either paying full attention or you're not. So if if this, the driver should always be ready to take control argument is there, well, it doesn't make much sense to me. If you're sitting there, let's say, ready to grab the wheel, you're you're engaged. So you're either engaged or you're not engaged. I believe it's more, it's not a gray zone. You you are you either are allowed to relax and hand, let's say, a control of so accidents happen that quick. When you're driving a car, your body responds, you would hope in a split second. But if you're kind of ha- half, you've divested this attention to the system, how can how can they say you should be ready? I just don't get it. Well, I think autopilot, especially the highway assist mode, is in its essence, it's not full self-driving. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's not cruise control either. It's much more advanced than cruise control. I don't want to insult it by saying that. But in the sense that it's not completely reliant at all. And this is obviously what's advertised and playing a video game while it's in operation, I think is it is irresponsible at the very least. And it's putting others in danger as well yourself. Obviously that's what happened. Um, so there's grounds there. Whereas I think if you had something like Waymo and this is, you know, you're sitting in the back, this is a fully robo taxi and that's what's being advertised. So. There's a big distinction there. Um, I, I get the argument, but I think it's an argument for 10 years time rather than a 2018 version of autopilot, which was essentially just a, an, a, a highway assist feature to get to get around, do you know? But if you got into a car and in the last 50 journeys, you went into the Google Maps or Google Maps equivalent and you typed in the address you were going to and it literally, you just sat there and it pulled you up outside the doors of the various places you were going to and you just stood out and off it went and parked itself. You basically trust the system. It has, it has, it has I suppose, um, trained the end user that it is a trustable system. And I think that's the point where a human condition, you go, that's fine. And if you've taken 50 journeys, as perhaps young Wang did, you kind of look down and play a computer game because it's worked and it's proven itself as reliable. A 2018 Tesla autopilot doesn't have that features. Do you know what I mean? A, 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 Waymo, a 2024 Waymo RoboTaxi does. I suppose that would just that would just drop you off. But uh, autopilot back in the day, it, it probably could do all that. It had the capabilities, but it wasn't allowed to. Do you know? I, I, I'm not sure what the regulations were and how they developed, but I think for the most part, it's just to be used on motorways, essentially. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure it can do a lot, lot more. Obviously, it has to because that's where all the training is. But legally and what, what it's uh, allowed to do on the customer end, I, I think it's a lot more limited than, you know, put on your eye mask and get 20 minutes kip while you what and then you arrive at your meeting do you know what i mean 
Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know, I'm sure a world of progress has been made in the five years since that young lad lost his life. And I mean, it's both this leads into it being a 12 grand a year service now with a, a mandated one month free trial. Um, and I might just pop in and discuss that story because it's, it's, it's very interesting. That's why I'm saying those two stories kind of sit beside each other. On one hand, there's, let's say, an argument against uh, a full uh, auto drive and then there's a, a mandated trial that you must take if you buy the car yeah i question the timing especially knowing it was mandated specifically by elon musk it, it feels a bit icky but um but yeah it, it's an interesting story and i think tesla benefit a lot more than just awareness we always talk about the miles traveled and how that trains the system and i think that's a big factor in this too yeah. And what's also interesting as well is that like at the end of the first quarter of 2024, Tesla is like, it's really known for doing everything it can to hit its sales targets. It, that's just the way it's behaved for years. Um, even having its top employees deliver cars. Like there was a time where everyone on the floor is like deliver these cars because we are going to hit our targets. And, and it's that kind of mindset, I think that's sponsoring the mandated free trial and offering this trial, a free trial will not only attract buyers who were already considering it, um, but it might also turn some people away um, if they think the Tesla offering is a bit more complicated. Uh, my wife bought a Tesla a few years ago, um, and we were, I suppose, I wouldn't say surprised, but in order for all the nice stuff to work in it, there was a 10 or a month subscription, you know, for your Spotify and all the other things. So it's another subscription that I suppose when you buy a car, but well, where we had never anticipated a subscription for a car. And I think what we're looking at now is people might say, you know, but am I, am I going to get the best out of this car? Because now all of a sudden this subscription, which albeit has a different value proposition to Netflix working in your car, is a grand a month. And that's a complicated thing for consumers at the moment. Um, and it's also releasing this free trial uh, alongside, obviously, a new version of the software, which has been imaginatively named V12. Nice name. Well done, Tesla. And it relies you know, entirely on AI. So we're, we're seeing now not only self-drive, but we're seeing now AI-powered cars, which is obviously the buzzword of the moment. Um, but some of the, Tesla's biggest fans and some of his employees have said really great things about this new version, um, which is not surprising. No, it's a, some of Tesla's biggest fans would say great things about their waste bill, I'd say. Of course, like an Apple fanboy or fangirl. Yeah, yeah. But the basic bottom line is that Tesla can now collect more video data to further improve its AI. Um, and it means more people might use the software without following Tesla's guidance to watch over it and be ready to take over the control if needed. And I think that's the kind of stage of the technology we're at in the world at the moment. I might also say one other thing, which is when, you, when you're when you in America, America, more so than any other country, is a, is a nation governed by rules and laws. And we every country has rules and laws, but America, there's a lot of crisp red lines. And, and to that point, the roads of America are almost like a metaphor for the legal system. They're very clearly laid out. And a self-drive car, uh, I don't know what the right tech speak is, can figure the roads, I think, a lot easier in America than it will when it's driving from Arnmore into Salt Hill in Galway. Like you've got yourself a whole different kettle of fish when you go for a little drive in Ireland. It's like bring me to Supermax immediately in Hedford and the car looks at you and goes, I don't even know what you're saying. <laughs> Test uh, test that AI system on the Irish country roads with grass growing in the middle and the speed limit is 80 kilometers an hour. It would, it would learn pretty quick. Bring me to the banks of the car. I've been going fishing. The car hasn't, I hope, not in the year 3022. Yeah. And it's interesting. I think just your last point you made, your last point you made before we started taking the piss about this is probably the future of driving eventually. And there's going to be irresponsible drivers. There's an irresponsible drivers now. There's going to be irresponsible drivers in the future. It probably looks a bit different. Um, but self-driving in particular, where you're relinquishing control has to be held to such a higher standard when it comes to safety. And, and, and it will, especially talking about a global rollout and, you know, the roads in Ireland with grass middle, growing in the middle of them, 
that it's it's a different animal in Phoenix and San Francisco and LA and Vegas. Yeah, it could come out a lot quicker, but for a full rollout, it'll be a long, long time, in my opinion, anyways. Would a mother put their toddler in a self-driving car and say, here, bring bring that child to crash or whatever? Like, that's a real litmus because that's the most treasured asset in the world is the newborn of a parent. And if you are going to put your newborn in a car and l let them off somewhere, I think that's a litmus for how trusted this tech will be. Um, very interesting story to see it evolve and it will evolve. There's no denying this is coming our way and self-driving will eventually roll its way from R and more into Galway city. Completely. That's, that's the goal that's written. That's written on the door as you go to Tesla every day. We're going to take it down the coast road. Um, okay. Quick reminder folks from Vodafone business, our friends and sponsors here at stock club, you can get their free one-to-one -one digital support and advice service today to discuss a range of topics from social media tips, cybersecurity, and building a website for your business. Search Vodafone v -Hub or just click the show notes. All right, uh, big deal or no big deal? Do you want to go first? Will I go first? Come here, listen, hear to me. I, I want to hit you with this one. Taiwan Semiconductors, after getting a $6.6 .6 billion check to build a plant in Arizona, is this a big deal or no big deal? Yeah, not just a plant, it's it's third plant. It's third plant in Arizona or third plant in... Third plant in Arizona, so one complex, but uh, it's aiming for three plants. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal, but also not a surprise to anyone, if that makes sense. So uh, the Biden administration, Biden administration brought in this CHIPS Act, where it's just trying to ramp up domestic microchip production. It's best in, I think it's earmarked $58 billion for it. Um, about $30 billion of that is directly going to grants for uh, chip companies. So and when we talk about Taiwan Semiconductor, it owns about 60% of the semiconductor foundry market. So this is basically the foundry market is the factories that build and manufacture integrated circuits in these microchips. Uh, and then a company like NVIDIA or Qualcomm will buy those kind of, we'll say cinder blocks, do the designs on them themselves. So uh, the term is the term for what? Taiwan Semiconductor do is they build the fabs and then company like NVIDIA will be fabless. So not confused with fabulous, which a lot of investors probably would call as well. They do all their work on top of it. So think about it like a supplier. Do you know what I mean? BMW doesn't produce everything that goes into the car itself. It'll buy raw materials from everywhere else. The Taiwan Semiconductor is kind of like the number one supplier to the semiconductor industry. Uh, it controls about 60% of the market. I think second place is Samsung with around 11. So it gives an inkling into how important this company is. I'd say a lot of people will call it one of the most important businesses in the world. Um, some of that has to do perhaps with its geopolitical status. Um, there's a lot of tensions in Taiwan. People are very concerned about China's influence on the region, potential invasion. Uh, also, earthquakes. Did you see that a few weeks back? I did, yeah. Yeah, shocking. Jesus, scary. Unbelievable. I actually think it was only last week, wasn't it? It was last week, yeah. 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 Uh, would you believe I was talking to somebody in Taiwan on the day of the earthquake, and the other guy didn't turn up, and I was taken aback at how the joke was, oh, well, I hope the earthquake didn't get him. I, I, I wouldn't participate in the joke, but I was... A kind of obviously the earthquakes are a part and parcel of living in earthquake zones but really i suppose you got to deal with things through comedy yeah it's just dark comedy but I, I get it i suppose this has shown or exposed i suppose the over-reliance on a company one company like uh taiwan semiconductor to produce such a vital building block to i would say technology the world economy is so reliant on semiconductors and if one country controls 60% of the building blocks of said conductor, you know, it's a pain point. So a big motivating factor behind the CHIPS Act is the company can move away slightly from the shadow of China if they're also producing in the US. Um, the $6.6 .6 billion number sounds huge, but if you look at how much uh, Taiwan Semiconductor are actually investing, I think it's only about 10% of their total spend on this Arizona Arizona plants, well, three plants, as I said. So uh, Taiwan follows Intel and global foundries, 
the third company to receive this type of grant. Intel got 8.5 billion. So it just shows how much importance the US are putting on this because they basically recognize it as a national security issue. They used to control 37% of the semiconductor production in the world. That number has dropped down to 12%. Um, so they're, they're basically realized that they're exposed there. Uh, so they want to push, this CHIPS Act wants to push uh, that number to 20% of global production by 2030. So yeah, big deal. Um, it was no surprise that Tyrone Semiconductor was going to get this money, but really important, I suppose, machinations happening in geopolitical sense, but also uh, lack of reliance on Taiwan. I think COVID exposed that as well, moving out from under the shadow of China. Uh, so yeah, a lot going on there. Um, so yeah, big deal. All right, where, where are we taking you? Oh yeah. So Disney, uh, Disney survives a proxy battle against activist investor, Nelson Peltz, big deal or no big deal. Yeah. So for our listeners benefit, Nelson Peltz lost this high profile proxy fight against Disney board on Wednesday of last week when shareholders voted by a, a huge margin to reject Peltz's proposal that he and a former Disney uh, CFO, I think it was Jay Rosalo, be granted board seats. So yeah, um, Triton Fund Management, that's Pelz's firm. They've just been waging this major campaign against the Disney board. They've been arguing that it wasn't adequately performing its duty. They've been saying that the CEO Bob Iger didn't have enough skin in the game. Um, and the main criticisms from from Peltz himself was Disney's board uh, where basically had a botched succession plan for Iger. They'd failed to put together a, a profitable streaming strategy. And it, I suppose it was the ultimate boardroom battle. It's the, certainly the biggest boardroom battle we've seen in quite a long time because the strength and the visibility of the Disney brand. But wait to hear this. Over the course of the scrap, both sides engaged in a media and advertising blitz to prove their case to shareholders. Disney spent $40 million on an advertising campaign and Peltz spent about $25 million. $65 million was spent in, I suppose, the articulation of bun throwing for the, for, for the voting, uh, for the voters concerned. And I think it's a big deal, but a bit like characterized by that movie Sliding Doors, do you, remember, do you ever see that movie with Sliding Doors? It was called Sliding Doors, Gwyneth Paltrow. Uh, two stories diverge where Gwyneth Paltrow's character misses a train just by a second. Um, she bumps into someone running down the stairs in a tube and she hits a train or she misses the train and then does, her life takes two entirely different directions. And what, what I'm saying is that we'll never really know what the other path would have delivered because Peltz's, uh, I suppose, target was to unlock shareholder value but his attempt has been quashed. Uh, Bob Iger re remains at the helm. So it's a big deal, but it's a big deal that's over. Nothing has changed. It's status quo. Yeah, and it's funny, if you look back, I'm not sure when Pelt started buying up shares, but he probably made money on them uh, if it was any time over the last two years. Do you know? His stock is up, uh, stock is up at about 120 today. It was hovering at 80 bucks for ages. 80 bucks for ages, yeah. So yeah, I, I, I looked at Disney a while back. There was a lot of doom and gloom, obviously thrown to light a lot by Pelts as well. But there's more systemic issues. I think people seem to be over superhero movies. Obviously, the blockbusters were such a source of revenue that doesn't seem as sustainable as other parts of the business. But yeah, it, it really... It's like we always say, you know, the market overreacts both directions. A company like Disney to be down trading at, I think the lowest they got to market cap was 130, 140 billion was, was kind of nuts. And I think investors have realized that with or without Peltz's help. So, yeah. All right, you're going to give us an elevator pitch. I'm going to give a sneak peek after that, and then we can go about our separate ways. Okay, well, I'm going to keep the elevator pitch pretty fast. Um, but I ran a report in Nexus to find a company, to find their company, not a company, their company with the highest five-year revenue compounded annual growth rate and return on equity above 20%. 
uh, for reasons that we've explained in the past, but basically businesses that grow revenue, it's the, the number one metric for share price uh, performance followed by share return on equity. So I stuck both of those into Nexus and the name popped out in top spot that I'm going to share. And I've seen it over and over on my screeners recently. And it's a company called Catalyst, Catalyst Pharmaceuticals, which works on creating medicines for people with rare diseases. And it's an interesting business and, and a very promising business. It's in America's best small companies list on Forbes in 2023. And the business was founded just over 20, about 22 years ago. And it initially concentrated on developing therapies to treat addiction. In 2012, they shifted their focus to rare diseases and in licensed patents to develop uh, a, a drug, a product called Firdaps. Firdaps is how I'm going to pronounce it. You know, drugs always have a funny name, um, so they're not confused. And it's a treatment for uh, Lambert Eaton uh, misothenic syndrome, which I'm going to call LEMS. And it's a very rare neuromuscular disorder. And, and the drug was approved by the FDA just in 2018 and launched commercially in 2019. And it's now available in the US for adults and kids aged six to uh, 17 with limbs. And additionally, Canada's healthcare authority also approved it for patients in that country. But to discuss um, Catalyst, it's, it's, it's important to discuss a thing I read about many, many moons ago called the orphan drug status, which is a regulatory designation in the US that incentivizes uh, drug companies to develop treatments for rare diseases. Um, because these diseases affect such a small number of people, pharma companies otherwise would be unlikely to see a return on investment if they went to pursue a drug that cures them or treats them. And um, they needed this encouragement. So to address this problem or this opportunity slash problem, uh, the orphan drug designation offers benefits like tax credits for research and development, exemption from certain fees, and most often a seven-year exclusive marketing period after their approval. And this exclusivity allows the developer to recoup their investment costs without competition. It makes it more financially attractive to bring tre treatments uh, to patients. And I, I, I'm not going to describe the condition LEMS. I ended up reading all about it in, in Catalyst's uh, investor relations uh, deck, other than to say that 50% of people with the condition have an underlying cancer. It causes debilitating and progressive muscle weakening and fatigue. It's a terrible thing. It's a horrible thing. So first up, we want a company to succeed in its treatment. And it really is when you read about these conditions, you, uh, to go off the topic a bit, you, re you really realize that health is wealth. Um, so if all the more power to the orphan drug status thing, which is is genius, a regulatory genius, if you ask me. And, and it is another example, tiny example of the best of America. Like America's identified that these 100 people with this rare illness will never get treated unless they stimulate drug companies to address the opportunity and they have done so successfully and drug companies know the power and the benefit of orphan drug status so anyway not to over uh, emphasize that that's what catalyst has and when you look at their ir deck um investor relations deck they they have they have some strong content under strategic growth initiatives, which range from expanding the commercial footprint. As I mentioned, they already got approval in Canada. They've already got US in the bag, of course. They're going to expand the portfolio in rare and orphan diseases, which is inordinately complex. You mean to treat a, dr a condition that's very, very well known, like Alzheimer's, it's hard enough. Try and find you know, enough people to test a drug on um, where only a handful of people have that condition is in its own right a headache. And then they're going to invest in portfolio diversification. So the business has a nice strategy, but when you kind of look at um, its revenue growth, everyone loves when I describe the shape of a curve. You know this, Mike, it's our thing. It's the one thing that keeps our listeners. It's been whoop, Nike. Now the next few years, when you look at their projections, so the, the, the revenue grew from around 100 million in the year 2019 to about 400 million in, in uh, 2023. So it was a 4X and they anticipate uh, revenue to hit about six, uh, 630 million in 2026. So the revenue curve, if you like, 
continues to grow, but not as abruptly as it has done. But return on equity has always been really efficient on this business, though. So it was it's never dipped below 20 percent since 20 since it commercialized the drugs. Um, so that's Catalyst Pharmaceuticals. It's a market cap of about one point eight billion dollars. Uh, obviously, it's profitable and it is doing something worthy and we hope it succeeds. And certainly if you were to just pick a business without knowing what it does, which is foolish in the extreme, you'd, you, Catalyst would make a short list of businesses that you would what you would be attracted to. That's really interesting. That orphan, uh, orphan drug stuff is really interesting too. I was invested in a business 20, I would say, 20, um, what are we at now? 2024, I have to check here. I'd say 25 years ago, I invested in an orphan drug company called Transchirotic Therapies, which was a little brought to my attention by the motley fool uh specifically a service they had called uh, hidden gems and thomas gardner their co-founder uh had highlighted it and it was it was it was an education unto itself the um the whole orphan drug thing it's been around for that long and way longer and it's also a tremendously powerful thing i am in such admiration of that nation for that alone, you know, to just think that these people, like there's no one else looking at these conditions. So in America, there's a great financial motivation and, and ultimately commercial businesses are coin operated. And I think it's a great thing. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, catalyst pharmaceuticals. All right. Quick sneak peek from me then. And we'll, uh, so just next week's charge and fearless, which is available to all of our invest subscribers. So the it's going to be one of the most profitable businesses in the UK. If you're an attentive listener, you should know what company I'm talking about as it was a very recent elevator pitch, uh, but I'm not going to give it away now, just in case you want to hear more or someone is very enticed by this. Uh, we dive deeper into the company's amazing margin profile, its most advantage over all its competitors, and the sheer advantage it has in terms of eyeballs, um, the risks involved. We talked through some key figures like growth, profitability, insider ownership, uh, so to see all that and a lot more, including 10 foundational stocks to build your portfolio, you can sign up for invest at mywallstreet.com slash invest, or you can find in the link in the show notes for this episode. Okay. And uh, before we finish, I just want to give a quick shout out to our friends at Vodafone Business. If you're a business owner in need of a leg up when it comes to your digital transformation, get yourself over to Vodafone VHub to book your appointment today. You can find this link in our show notes. Um, that's it. Emmett, thanks again for joining me for a great show. And everyone else, you've, you've, you've heard the sales pitch, get over yourself to mywallstreet.com slash invest. Uh, or if you're not ready just yet to subscribe to invest, you can just go to mywallstreet.com, sign up for our mailing list, and in doing so, you'll receive a full deep dive on one of our favorite deep moat stocks. Thanks for joining us today, and we will talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.